live. <laughs> Um, I I can't see that we're live at the moment, but um, I, oh, ah, brilliant. I can see we're live now, which is fantastic. So welcome everyone to the first parallel session of the day. Um, thanks everyone for streaming out of the main hall and coming down the corridor into one of the parallel sessions. Um, you'll see that we've split up the event into a variety of themes and um, key themes um, to tackle the climate emergency. Um, and you'll see that this particular parallel session is the built environment. Um, so if you've come here expecting to hear about mobility and transport, I'm afraid you're in the wrong room. So if you could move along to the other room, that would be fantastic. But for those who are here, um, welcome to a really exciting um, uh, session. We've got two fantastic speakers for you today. Um, Sarah Lee, who is the brains behind the future Plymouth 2030 webinar series. And um, Sarah is going to be updating us on some of the learning from that. And also Steve Goodhue, um, Professor Steve Goodhue, who's the brains behind the Cobbage project. That's um, a new project to, to use Cobb as a building product. So, without further ado, please can I pass over to Sarah and ask Sarah to come to the stage. Okay, welcome Sarah, and um, please take it away. Hi Paul, and thank you, and hello everyone. Uh, as, as Paul said, my name's Sarah Lee, and I'm an architect at Stride Triglown here. In uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Paul and the team at the Sustainable Earth Institute and the Low Carbon Devon team uh, about 18 months ago. So as Paul said, I'm going to speak to you about net carbon in the built environment, net zero carbon, sorry, in the built environment and the key ambitions and opportunities for our future Plymouth 2030 webinar series. So as, as mentioned, I'm a, an architect here at, in Plymouth for Stride Triglown. We're a, a national architectural practice. We're one of the largest in the UK and we have nine offices around the country. I'm based here in uh, Plymouth with about 20, 24 other people uh, and I've also been chairing the Plymouth branch of the RIBA for the last four years, I just handed over in September. Uh, so I've been involved in organising lots of events and, and learning opportunities and site visits and things for our local, not just architectural but construction community. So um, here's our front page, is this what the Ho could look like in the future? The Future Plymouth 2030 webinar series uh, aims to bring together the best local and national minds in sustainability. We want to learn from each other. We want to explore collaborative ways to achieve net carbon zero nationally and regionally. We want to empower people. We want to help people to understand what needs to be done by gaining knowledge and insight and the tools to make changes and to take positive climate action. And ultimately, we want to help to achieve a better, more sustainable future for Plymouth, the UK and the world. So a little bit of background, obviously, as has been mentioned this morning already, climate change has been acknowledged for decades and this is not a new situation. Uh, it was encouraging that the climate emergency declarations were made in 2019 by the government and also our local authorities, including Plymouth. But is it really being treated like an emergency urgently? Um, I felt that it wasn't. I've, I've been an architect here in Plymouth for 20 years. I trained at the University of Plymouth uh, and I've, I've always felt a little bit embarrassed that we're not doing enough, we're not doing more. So with my RIBA hat on, I was asked to attend the Devon Climate Emergency Thematic Hearing uh, regarding the built environment back in November 2019. It was at a time when the I R RIBA was also issuing its 2030 climate challenge to all its members, which uh, again, I felt was encouraging a marker in the stand, a call to arms to architects to try and encourage their clients to understand why we need better, better performing buildings. But I was a little bit disappointed that we were still talking about whether we could dangle carrots to encourage clients and developers to produce better buildings or whether it was time to get the big stick out. So I realised that there is still much more need for education, more open discussion, learning, more sharing of experience and knowledge needed. And I set about trying to formulate a plan. 
And this is when I met the uh, Sustainable Earth Institute Low, Low Carbon Devon team at the university. It, Paul Hardman kindly showed us around their interesting building, which is a real working um, experiment um, and proof that, that you can retrofit buildings to a high standard. Uh, and we set up a working group here in Plymouth, including the council too. Uh, and we, we were set about planning a, a physical two day conference, much like this one today would be if it was a physical conference. And then COVID hit. <laughs> so just a little reminder there, a little slide to show you. I mean, obviously we set up with the University of Plymouth. I've got the RIBA, the Plymouth City Council, Constructing Excellence, Plymouth Group and Building Plymouth Initiative, our local um, construction coverall, low carbon Devon team. And obviously Stride Triglau, my company, have, have allowed me to commit time to, to sorting this out. So we set about... Um, designing a brand, designing a logo. We wanted uh, Future Plymouth 2030, we set the name up. We wanted it to be an autonomous um, initiative which brought everyone together. We've had quite a lot of success with pan-professional events across Plymouth over the years. Uh, and uh, actually this is an issue which affects all of us. It's not just one, one person, one industry, one, one profession that can fix this. We need to work together. So we designed a logo, we had some nice illustration done, we, we took it online, we designed a website with Miles Noble here from Altitude Design, who's um, been our webinar compare as well, if any of you have attended any of our webinars you'll have seen him in action. Um, and the website really has been essential as a place to keep all the information about what we're trying to do, the speakers, the content of each of the webinars, uh, and what we tried to do is have a, a topic. We, we've broken the, the issues that affect carbon reduction in the climate, uh, in the construction industry, in the built environment, down into bite-sized chunks. And we've introduced three specialists on that topic um, to speak at each event with a Q&A session at the end. So it's been really interesting to hear about uh, different perspectives on a similar topic, whether that's an architect, an engineer, a client, or a university lecturer from a, a theory and a research perspective. So we, we launched in November 2020 last year and in the last seven months we've just finished our, our first season one in June um, with 14 live webinars which has produced 28 hours of, of learning content which has all been recorded with permission of, from the speakers and it's now hosted on a, a YouTube channel which is a resource that we can share, catch up, rewatch, or refer back to so that we can share that learning with people from all, all walks of life, whether they're students, lecturers, whether they're practitioners out in the workplace, whether they're council officials or um, officers. And we just want to, to keep that dialogue going, keep those conversations going so that people get more familiar with the, the language used in, in how to reduce carbon in the built environment and, and how we actually go about it, what action needs to be taken. We've been very lucky, we've had 48 um, speakers from a wide range of professions and sectors who've all kindly given up their time for free to, to help engage in this webinar series. They've all spoken really um, knowledgeably about their, their individual experience or knowledge, whatever it is, um, and they've, they've all given their time willingly to help to, to spread this knowledge and, and gain momentum. This is just a snapshot of some of the partners who've been involved, a lot of the professional institutes involved in the construction industry, who many of us are, are members of, a lot of local architects, local contractors, local engineers, local um, organisations who, who want to keep this ball rolling. Um, as the speaker said previously, we should have started this a long time ago. We've got a big, big mountain to climb. Uh, and one good news story is that Plymouth City Council actually pledged their official support for the webinar series back in January uh, at the re release of their annual Climate Emergency Action Plan. Their support for our webinar series was, was recorded at 2.87 and, and they have kindly given um, suggestions for speakers and there are projects and initiatives in the city which we'd like to talk about, include in our series. Uh, and link in with the other topics so that we can see progression. We see this as a rolling, a rolling programme, this Climate Emergency Action Plan has to be renewed annually and we'd like to, to integrate it with the Future Plymouth webinar series so that we can um, show progress as the years 
roll on. So we've we've had nearly 1,200 people attending our webinars live, which is quite astand astounding. The um, the idea has really snowballed from what was supposed to be a two-day physical conference to this continuous webinar series. We've been running them almost fortnightly, just for two hours uh, every other Wednesday. And the stati statistics are quite good. We've had an average of 70 to 80 live attendees per webinar right through to the end of the series a couple of weeks ago. Um, and as I said, we're, uh, taking it online, I think, has actually done us some favours uh, because although most of the attendees are from Plymouth and the Southwest, we have actually attracted people from farther afield in, in the UK and also globally, which blows my mind. We have, as you can see from this map of the world, we have actually had listeners from pretty much all corners of the globe, um, which I think that just shows how, uh, how easily people can actually engage with this kind of forum. Um, so COVID perhaps did us a favour by making us take this online. The website has had nearly 7,000 visitors since it was launched back in November, uh, 4,600 of those unique, with over 16,000 page views, an average of two and a half pages each. Visitors are actually spending a few minutes on each page, which I'm reliably informed suggests that they are actually reading and engaging with the content, which is brilliant. And we have an exit rate of 50%, which means that half of those people are actually opting to continue to look at another Future Film of 2030 web page. And our mailing list, which is available to connect to on this website, now also has about 570 subscribers. That was as of last week. Social media has obviously played, played a big part in the success of this webinar series too, particularly LinkedIn. It's allowed us to promote the series, share information and expand our network. Uh, you can find lots of posts about it from me and we've also set up a future Plymouth 2030 LinkedIn page directly. That has 181 followers now. We've also got 169 Twitter followers, 230 Instagram followers and those um, are more recent in just in the last few months. Our YouTube channel also links to the website, as I said earlier, where you can catch up on past webinar recordings. And as a, an independent social media platform itself, this allows us to reach another type of audience. Oh, we, without true integration and collaboration, none of this would have been possible. We've had a really strong, diverse working group, true partnership. Uh, we are all in this together. As I said, we all use buildings, we live in buildings, we use them to shop, work and play in. Um, so we all have a responsibility. We can't just wait for the government to change regulations and insist that we, we change the, uh, the standards of our buildings and retrofit buildings. We have to look at this from a, a bottom up perspective. And my view is that if we've, if we've just triggered a few light bulb moments for a few people, then those people will share their learnings and their understandings with their friends and family and we'll will gradually make progress together. I think COVID has been in a way helpful. As I said, it meant that we took the webinar series online, but also it's shown us all that behavior change is possible overnight. We've all had to just stay home, work from home. We've had to change how we live. Uh, and so actually I think it has shown us that we, we do have the power of change in our hands and that we should be looking to, to help our planet by, by reducing carbon. We've had a rich variety of speakers, which has been Im impressive and has been a great attraction to our varied audience. We've, we've gleaned some information from our registration details that it's not just professionals who are uh, attracted to attend these webinar series. We've had students, we've had um, officers from the council and even just lay people and retired folk who just want to know more and how they can help to, to make an improvement. And we found that uh, yeah, good old fashioned communication is key, even though we are using the medium of the internet to, to reach out to people, we are just talking and sharing our information and our learning and our experience. And our success, I think, is measured by the data that I've just presented to you. I mean, the, the statistics that we've achieved already just in this first season uh, is impressive. Um, and also the, the support from the council, um, we're really, really pleased about. Um, and they wish the, the webinar series to continue. So little, little did I know when I set off on this journey that this might become an annual thing. So we're, we're already planning season two in the background. 
um, with many speakers and topics that have been volunteered or recommended to me, which we are masterminding the new programme to start in the autumn, hopefully in October. If you, you'd like to know more, please sign up to the, the mailing list on our, our website. And also we plan to hold some physical event, events when COVID restrictions allow, hopefully later this year. So I'd just like to say thank you to our sponsors, because obviously there is a little financial cost involved with setting up the website and the webinar series. The, the RIBA have been a great support to me. Uh, Stride Triglan, obviously my company for allowing me time to do all this. Uh, the University of Plymouth, the Sustainable Earth Institute and Low Carbon Devon have accessed ERDF funding and support from the government. And also Plymouth City Council, as I said, they've, they've come on board fully now. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to working together more in the future. And that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. And yeah, I can recommend uh, the website and the, the, the YouTube channel. It's a fantastic resource. And I, I personally really enjoyed watching the series over, over the last six months or so. Um, so um, can I remind everyone, uh, please do put any questions that you may have in the Q&A box. Um, and, and so we're going to move immediately on to the next presentation and then have a joint Q&A at the end. So please, can I hand over to Steve Goodhue, who's going to do a live lab demonstration of the Cobb Wall project. So over to you, Steve. Morning, everyone. I'm just taking uh, COVID protection off. Uh, we're in a space where we're allowed to actually have um, no masks in because of the ventilation. Um, welcome to the Live Lab Corbeau and welcome to the university's civil engineering laboratories. This presentation is slightly different to a lot of the other ones because we're going to be taking you around some of the laboratory activities. I'm Steve Goodhue. I'm principal investigator for the Corbeau project. One of the things that's difficult about the built environment is uh, the amount of waste that we have and the fact that not all of our buildings are built with local materials and also we tend to lack energy efficiency in certain areas. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take the waste product that comes from the foundations of the houses that we build and actually build the walls with that product. There's one big problem. It doesn't match the current thermal building regulations part L2. So which case our project is trying to take earth and fiber and produce an optimized cob material. We'll have a quick look over here. These are a series of different types of earth samples. These are a series of different types of fibers and we're combining them and optimizing them and trying to find which of these is the best. And we've got so far as to work out which are the best type of products. We're then testing them. And if we have a look, a look down here, we're using a, uh, a heat flux machine to give us an idea of the thermal conductivity. We're also testing the cores over here, just to make sure that structurally they're strong enough. And then if you have a little look over here, the next stage of the project is actually to build with scale walls. And once we've got scale walls, we can undertake measurements. And if you look just here, this is somebody actually undertaking, Jim Carfrey undertaking some moisture measurements within one of the built prototype walls. And finally, we're going to be looking at building a building on site, which is going to be going up at Kirkby Lodge using the new optimized material. Well, what does this optimized material actually look like? Well, if we have a look over here, this is a, a sample test wall. And we've got a composite layer construction where we have a structural layer here and we have a thermal light earth layer here. Density of this is about 1700 kilos per meter square, uh, meter cubed. This is much less, um, probably in or around a third of that. And if I give you a quick demonstration of how strong it actually is, both the insulation and also the structural side, you can see it's a pretty durable material. I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration of the heating effect, and then I'm going to pass you over to a series of members of the team, Kevin, then through to Jim, then through to Matt, who will round the whole thing up. 
So let's have a quick look at a demonstration of the two composite layers as a measurement of their thermal properties. If you have a look down here, we can see we've got two hot plates. Both of them are at 71 degrees centigrade. And we've got two samples. This is our light earth. That was the red one that you saw earlier. This is the yellow structural layer. And we've got a thermal camera up here taking an image of the top surface of those two samples. And it's displayed on this screen. And what you can see here is, this is the structural layer, this is the insulating layer. And as you can see, the surface temperature of the structural layer is about 36 degrees centigrade. And you can see Jim's just popped his hand across and you can see the difference there. And over here, you can see Jim's hand reflected across onto the uh, insulated side, and that's way down at 28 degrees. So we're getting an eight degree difference between our insulating layer and our structural layer. Now I'm gonna pass across to Kevin Owen. He's giving give you an idea of the materials and the way we produce them. Okay, thanks Steve. Um, I'm Kevin Owen, uh, Senior Technician of the Cobbage Project. Um, as Steve said, the conundrum really, the problem was, is to improve uh, the thermal properties of carb, but the difficulty was if you put more organic fibrous material into it, it makes it weaker. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got a structural traditional carbon, on the other hand, you've got a light earth. And what we try to do is to combine both. Now here on my little table, my show and tell table, uh, we've got the ingredients for all that. Um, I'll just draw your attention to these two cylinders. This cylinder here, is of the structural material and this is the thermal as you can see the structural has shrunk they're both made out made from the same cylinder shrunk quite a lot more than the thermal so that was a problem to start with we thought that is there any way we can combine this but not you know to try and get over the shrinkage rate um, so that was a, a major issue of the first phase of our project and uh, and here we have what you get from the ground which is a clay rich soil. Uh, this comes out of the ground about 20% clay. Uh, it is rather too clayey for our purposes. It would shrink and crack too much. And um, therefore we had to condition it with some sand and that's between 20 mil and dust. Uh, and the proportions are about even, uh, we even mix for, uh, for both by weight. And as Steve mentioned, we tried various uh, types of fiber uh, we've eventually optimized this particular one with a flax straw. Now, the thing is about flax is it's a lot tougher than actual uh, wheat straw. Uh, it, it, it will break, but it's it's much stronger. Uh, so it's really a good a good uh, material to make the cob out of. We did try um, a hemp straw. Uh, this is a piece of hemp straw. It is extremely strong. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's been used to make ropes. The problem with this is that when you try and mix it, it, it tries to make itself into a rope, tangles around and, and clogs. So you end up with just kind of balls of, of uh, the, the hemp straw. So you wanted something that was loose enough, but strong enough to make a good bond. Um, the magic ingredient in this course is, is water. Uh, and I move over then to the other side, which is the, uh, the uh, thermal side. Uh, and we've produced some examples here of both the insulin, the structural and the thermal. Uh, and we put these through our heat flow meter to uh, ascertain what the um, thermal properties were. Now, the problem is, what were we to do? We, what we wanted to do was to combine these together, basically glue them like that. Um, the problem was the shrinkage rates, would they stick together? Uh, so we conducted a series of experiments and we found that uh, a very high clay slip, which this is, this is uh, a local soil, this is from Ottery St. Mary, very red uh, clay. Uh, we crush that down, we make it into a, a very silky slip, clay rich slip, and we mix it with uh, this material which is called shiv, which is the inner core of the hemp stalk. Uh, it has its own um, insulative properties. Uh, so when we mix those together, we can uh, make something that is like that. So 
again, it, it, it retains its shape. You can see the fibers, but it has inside of it clay. So on the one hand, we've got the original cob. So this is this is cob that we've had made, pre-made, pre-mixed. So in here, we've got the sand, uh, the flax, and the, the soil. Uh, the problem is, what, what do we do now to bring them together? So if we try and squash these two together, we found through our experiments that the transfer of moisture enabled one to complement the other, and it reduced the shrinkage. And here we've got some samples of that. So here's, here's a block that's on the thermal side, the structural side. They're both the same size, and they shrank at the same, more or less the same rate. And I'll uh, now hand you over to Jim, who is going to show you the test walls that we've built. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so the combination of this phase of the project are these two full-scale test walls. I don't know if the camera can get them both in. But what we've done is we've taken all the experimentation, all the incremental practical work we've been doing, and turned it into what is effectively a facsimile of a room. So we have two walls here, and over the top of them, we put some simple joists. At this stage, we will build a permanent ceiling on these two walls. And then what we're going to do is to demonstrate the efficacy of the whole system by applying the weight of the first floor and the roof of a building on top of these walls. So it doesn't really matter how many lab experiments we've done and how many tests we've carried out, nothing beats a practical, real demonstration of how the system will work. So that's why we've got these two full-scale walls. You can still see quite clearly, I hope, the the um, structural side and the thermal side and um, there's a sort of fairly rough join between them that's deliberate because it helps the, the material stay together and we have found it very difficult to separate the two layers when we have done so we're happy with that the other purpose of building these full-scale walls apart from to demonstrate visually how they work is we're doing a lot of measurements with them as well um, Matthew Fox very shortly will be talking about the moisture monitoring that we're doing but combined with the moisture monitoring and it's directly linked we're also looking at how the materials behave in terms of shrinkage so shrinkage might be a frightening term to anyone in the construction business but when you're dealing with natural materials it's almost inevitable and it's better to find out how the material is going to behave in advance so that architects and designers can take that on board when they're designing the buildings so I'll just give you a very simple demonstration of one of the measurements we've been doing. I've got a laser measuring device here, a Leica Disto, and built into this wall, we have these wooden pads at each end of the wall. And so we can measure between them to get an idea of how the whole wall is shrinking along its whole length. So I'll go to the far side to start the measurement. I turn on the Disto, it has a little red dot, which you probably can't see on the screen. For that, if I put the rear of the disto against this block of wood and then point the dot at the opposite piece of wood and then press the go button, it tells us that the wall is currently measuring 2.370 meters or 2,370 millimeters. And I can also remember that when we first built it, the measurement was 2,406, which means it shrunk by about 36 millimeters. And um, so this is a significant amount of movement, but it represents only about one and a half percent of the total length of the building. So having established that, we can then work with it. On this side, the wall we built here, it has an opening in it to demonstrate how you might put a lintel across to take the load above. So we've got a simple timber lintel here with a plywood base and it's taking the load and so far it's not moving. We've got lots, you can't see them, but there are lots of different measuring points here. We also have on the front, 
We have other measuring points. So apart from the, the simple measuring device I've shown you, we've been using a three-dimensional laser scanner in order to record the movements of the whole wall. So I'm now about to pass you over to Dr. Matthew Fox, who's going to tell us about the moisture monitoring of the walls. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, so over in this corner of the room, we've got a, a box of uh, instrumentation, um, and it's a series of different moisture sensors. So we've got uh, moisture sensors um, that, uh, that look like this, and they've got two metal prongs. Um, and we also have, more interestingly, these uh, long metal rods, which uh, sink into the wall. This, and uh, what they're doing is they're measuring the moisture content and the temperature um, at a series of different points along the length of the rod. You can see we've got one in here just now. So those, so, uh, just here, so you can see that those connect back into the box to the data logger and then feed back into the computer. Now, what we're doing is we're monitoring the, uh, the moisture content, volumetric uh, water content, over the period of the construction of these walls. And what we found, I, I actually just downloaded the data this morning, and what you can see is that the, the water was, or the moisture content was dropping off relatively quickly, and then it sort of plateaued out. So these lines at the top here represent the structural layer. So this is traditional cob. These lines down to, sorry. <laughs> These lines down towards the lower part of the thermal cob in particular, well, that, that yellow line is, uh, is close, but it's very, I think that's in the, uh, the structural cob. But what was quite interesting was these lines down here showed that um, over a three month, three month period, the thermal layer of the cob mixture dried out completely. So now what we're looking at um, over here this material is now uh, completely dry, which is incredible. Um, now, the reason why the moisture is, is fundamental is the fact that um, connected with the shrinkage testing that uh, Jim and Kevin have been doing, um, we can then learn how the, the building moves. And that's really important for architects and designers because um, if you want to install windows and doors, you don't want the building to keep moving. Um, now that's going to flow on to the, the actual building that we're going to be looking at building. Matt and team, Steve and team, just to let you know you have three minutes, okay? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay. So, if I just uh, swap hats, um, and um, part of my role is as a researcher at uh, Plymouth working with the Cobos team. But uh, putting on another hat, I'm also a project architect on uh, a building that's just about to break ground um, next week uh, on a, a prototype building just outside Kirkby Lodge. So those of you that have been to campus may well have seen the hoardings going up. Um, it's a relatively small building, so I've got a quick fly around here. So it's a relatively small building, uh, about 30 square meters in size. Uh, it's going to be a single classroom or meeting room. Uh, it has a mono pitch uh, standing seam roof construction, and we're looking to render it uh, in, a, in a kind of line render. So at the moment, we're looking at testing different render samples uh, to try to determine which type of render might work on a Cobo um, material better than others. So there's ongoing experiments that link back to this prototype building. And the importance of the prototype building is that it builds confidence for other builders, other architects, other clients, perhaps, uh, to maybe look at the Cobbage building and, and think, well, actually, this is a material that's viable um, and that can help us to, to produce a, a lower carbon um, product. Now, we've been looking at lots of different types of details, um, and we've got some, some sketches over here. So this is the, uh, the plinth detail that we've been, we were looking at very early on. And for us, it's not just about building a, a, a kind of a construction that uh, helps to support the Cobbage material, we also need to think about it holistically. So we're, we're looking at other materials and trying to minimize the embodied energy of the building as a whole. So thinking about what type of insulations can we get into the ground? You know, fo foam glass or, or clay laker uh, insulation beads uh, as alternatives to polystyrene or uh, materials that have a higher embodied energy. Um, and then thinking about uh, roof constructions um, and, and internal surface finishes. 
So it's not just limited to the extra cobweb material. We're looking at this as a kind of a, a complete package. Now, the, the, the project, this, this building is, on, is on site just now. It's just starting uh, with an estimated completion date of about middle of March 2022. So do please keep up with progress on this building. Uh, there'll be much to share with you over the coming months. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'm sure the rest of the team will as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, um, everyone, uh, for that brilliant live lab. Um, I think um, it's interesting, a lot of the questions that have come through have actually been comments just saying how great it is to see something practical and uh, very relatable. So thanks, everyone, for that. Um, Sarah, if I can bring you back up to the stage, that would be fantastic. So um, we have had a, a whole host of different questions that have come through. So um, if I try and theme a few of these, if that's okay. So if we start with uh, Steve and the team, um, there have been a number of questions specifically around skills. Um, so there was a question from, from Gavin uh, Derbyshire who asked, do you feel the skill set of contractors is up to scratch to take the built environment to a We've also had one from Lucy as well, um, who has asked, how will builders be upskilled to know about all of this? Are there training programs at low cost for those who have an interest? So please, can you let us know a little bit about um, the skills required and what your thoughts are around those questions? Sure. Uh, we have uh, par one partner in France and one partner here in the UK. Um, the UK partner is EBUKI, which is Earth Building UK in Ireland. Uh, and they are developing digital learning packages. So there will be filmed elements of each of the processes that needs to be taken into account before the building is built. Uh, and that's going to be available close towards the end of the project. So late uh, 2022. Also, the whole idea of us building the prototype here is to be able to use the building as a form of training, as well as uh, a form of a test lab as well. And the combination works really well. Um, also, the way that you build things sometimes impacts upon it, the embodied energy and therefore the embodied carbon. So that too is part of the aspects. I know we're short of time for questions, but I hope that answers people's questions uh, validly enough. That's brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and in terms of, do you, is there a website where people can um, follow and, and um, follow the, the progress? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, literally, if you type in Cobove into Google, it will take you straight to the EU website and that has got a resources section on a pull down. If you pull that down, there's technical information, there's all the presentations that we've done right the way through the project that are sitting up there. And there also is a number of peer review papers as well, which are coming out backing up this particular skill, data, whether it's thermal, structural, um, and all of that is a fantastic resource. We also have fantastic social media as well. We've got a load of supporters, many, many supporters on all the platforms. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, Sarah, I've got a question here for yourself about the future Plymouth series. Um, so will the future um, Plymouth series go more broadly than the built environment sector? Um, and also, how will the outcomes feed through to COP26? Oh, I think we can't hear you, I'm afraid. Let's have a look. Um, Katie, is it possible to get Sarah's sound working? Okay, I tell you what, you, you keep working on that in the background with Katie and um, I'll ask Steve another question if that's okay. Steve, are you still there? Certainly am. Okay, thank you. 
um, so um, one of the questions that's come through is uh, how would the cost of building a say a three bed semi using these materials compare to your bog standard brick box house? Extremely good question. I think it's like any new innovative material or process. At the start, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to happen. But as soon as the economies of scale start kicking in and contractors get used to the fact that their soil could be used to be able to produce homes, then that's a big step forward. For instance, I went to a site yesterday and they had 10,000 tonnes of what we think, we're pretty sure, is suitable subsoil. We're getting that subsoil analysed. Our building that we're putting up here will take maximum of about 38 tonnes. So you can imagine, there's an awful lot of buildings there sat in this waste material, and they're gonna have to pay the landfill tax to actually physically get rid of it. So what better than actually physically using it? I've just passed you across to Jim. I've got a very quick point to make in terms of cost. So what we're developing is a walling material. If you take the overall cost of that free bedroom semi-detached house, the walls represent no more than about 10% of the overall cost. So even if the walls are slightly more expensive to produce, it depends far more on the choices of the other materials of the building than just the walls. Brilliant. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Steve. Sarah, are you? can we hear you? Oh, you can't. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that, Sarah. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, if you put into your, the answers into the text, function then um I'll, I'll have a look go at reading those out so i've got we've only got two minutes to go so if i've got a question for for both of you um which is this is the built environment theme where a parallel session um and there's going to be lots of people who have their own homes um so for their own homes what one or two things would you recommend that people did in terms of actions to, um, to, to, to help uh, lower their carbon impact of their own built environment. Um, Steve, can I come to you with that? Sorry about that. Could you just briefly repeat the question? I think it was just out of earshot. Yeah, okay. So um, as an individual, uh, what would you recommend individuals do to reduce their own carbon footprint, say, within their own homes? Their own carbon footprint, I think the, 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 the words that come to mind are low-hanging fruit. Um, as far as built environment's concerned, it, it, it's doing the basics. So if you make sure that, for instance, your home is draft-proofed properly, that you, you have mechanisms for being able to set your thermostat at the correct time, that you do not have your heating system running over, beyond any time that you, you needed to do. And those are really no cost options virtually. I mean, draft proofing is, is a pittance as far as, you know, against putting full triple glazing into a property. However, if you're then thinking of refurbishing, that's when you can start thinking about upgrading. And I think that's crucial. Also, think about refurbed rather than doing new build. Um, as, as far as your own property is concerned. Ca try and get the space that you can out of your own property first. And then if you need the space, that's the time to actually physically invest in further elements. But I'm afraid that's very broad brush and I apologize that it's not particularly specific. No, that's perfect. Thanks, Steve. Okay, um, and just um, in terms of the question to um, Sarah about the, the future um, Plymouth 2030 series, um, they're already including permaculture, biodiversity, and urban design in the webinar series with lots more planned. So please do tune in to season two. I feel, feel like I'm a, a Netflix ad, but season two is gonna be fantastic, particularly in the lead up to COP26. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time um, for this, um, but please, um, do continue to discuss, or ask questions or discuss with other um, attendees. We have a discussion board set up specifically for the built environment. Please do, do go and look at that. 
Um, we now have a, a 10 minute break. So please do go and grab a cup of tea, go to the discussion board, and then after the break, we have the first of our marketplace sessions. So please, can I thank our presenters and please can we have um, the virtual round of applause for everyone here. So thanks to Steve and, to, and his team and thanks to Sarah. Okay, thanks everyone. See you later. Bye.